Okay, Mr. Marshall, I see 636. I see a quorum of the board. Amherst Media is with us. You are a co-host of this meeting. I do believe we're good to go. Okay, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. <clears throat> welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of February 21st, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.36 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. <clears throat> Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda, posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the Port Planning Board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colvin. Here. Uh, Jesse Mager. Major. Thank you. Here. Janet McGowan. Here. Karen Winter. Here. Fred Hartwell. Here. Yo and we know that Johanna Newman is absent this evening, and I, Doug Marshall, am present. <clears throat> Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so uh, the time now is 6.40. And the first item on the agenda is the minutes from November 29th, 2023. Uh, I believe those were not included in our packet. Is that correct? And they were emailed to us later. That's correct. They are posted in your packet now, but they were not included when we sent the packet link to right. you. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so members of the board, did anyone have any comments on those minutes? Did everyone get to read? to review them, I guess we'll start by. So I see a couple of hands raised. Uh, Janet, your hand is up. Is this the meeting that I didn't attend? I'm trying to, was I not there? Janet was there. Oh, okay. It was the meeting at the very end of November, right after Thanksgiving. And it dealt with primarily with University Drive. It was one of those extra meetings. Okay. It was in person. And I was tardy in getting these minutes to you, but it, they're timely since you're going to be talking about this topic tonight. Okay. I read those. Thank you. All right. Whoops. Uh, looks like I lowered 
got my hand up. Uh, okay, so um, sounds like pretty much everybody read these minutes. Uh, and that being the case, did anyone have any edits or changes they thought should be made to the minutes as drafted by Chris? All right, uh, I'm seeing two hands. Bruce, you got it there first. I'll, I'll move to accept the minutes as presented. Okay, Jesse? I was just gonna second, it's fine. Oh, I got balloons. Yeah, if you put your fingers up, some versions of Zoom will, will make you uh, <laughs> celebrate, let's say. I'll try and turn that off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, at least you're, you haven't turned into a cat's head or something. <laughs> okay, great. So we have a motion to approve and a second. Uh, does uh, any other, anyone have any further comments? All right, so then we'll go through uh, a roll call vote. Starting Bruce with you. I approve. And Fred. I I approve. And Jesse. I approve. Uh, Janet. Hi. Karen. Hi. And I'm an I as well. That's six in favor and one member absent. Those minutes are approved. Okay. Time now is 6.43 and we'll go on to public comment. So I often read the names of the people I can see in the public at this time. So I'll start with that. I see Alexandra Hill, George Ryan, John Kennedy, Jonathan Salvan, Mara Keene, Stephen Kramer, Ted Parker, and Tom Reedy. And so members of the public, do any members of the public want to make a comment at this time on something not on tonight's agenda? I know a number of you are here for the uh, Amherst Hills conversation later. Okay, I am not seeing any hands raised from the public. All right, I guess we will conclude that no public comment at, for this meeting this evening. <clears throat> okay, time is 644 and we will go on to the third item on the agenda, which is the Amherst Hill subdivision request to accept the public roadways in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 41, uh, Section 81G through 81I, Review uh, of the layout plan to accept Hawthorne Road, Concord Way, and Linden Ridge Road, excluding the cul-de-sac, as public ways as referred by town council. All right, so Chris, I was thinking maybe you should make an introduction to this uh, since uh, this has been a long running saga and a number of the members of the board are new to this. Yes, I have an introduction prepared, so I can go ahead with that if you would like me to. Yes, I would. Okay, so good evening. I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director, um, and I just <clears throat> wanted to give you some words of introduction about this um, topic. Town Council has been asked by the developer Tofino Associates to accept as public ways the subdivision roadways that were built as part of the Amherst Hills subdivision. The residents of Amherst Hills are in support of this action. Amherst Hills is a neighborhood located off Station Road in Amherst and Old Amherst Road in Belchertown. So that's in the eastern part of the town of Amherst. The roadways that the town council has been asked to accept are <clears throat> Hawthorne Road, Concord Way, and Linden Ridge Road. There's a cul-de-sac at the end of Linden Ridge Road that has not been completed and is not part of the acceptance request. Pam, can you bring up the map? Yes, that's what I'm trying to do. Great. Okay, so then you can see where this is in relation to Belchertown. Um, and it's coming, it's coming. Coming, yeah. Takes a minute to load sometimes. There it is, and I just sent it to you today, so thank you very much for having this available. 
Um, so you can see that um, the dark line that goes down the uh, middle, kind of the middle of this page, is the town line, and everything to the right of that is in Belchertown, and everything to the east of that is in Amherst. So yeah. the town is being asked to accept Hawthorne Road, Linden Ridge Road, and Concord Way, and to not accept the little cul-de-sac that sticks up to the north, that little lollipop looking thing. Um, Pam, if you can just scroll down a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. The other way. Yes, so that little brown lollipop yes. thing that is, it sort of looks like a thermometer actually. Um, so we're not being asked to accept that because that hasn't been completed. And you can see where this is in relation to Amherst Woods, which is just to the left here. Trillium Way, Larkspur Drive, Wildflower. Many of you have friends and acquaintances who live over there. So that's where this um, Amherst Hills is located. Um, the subdivision was begun by Jeffrey Flower in the late 1990s, and it was purchased by Doug Cole of Tofino Associates and Cole Construction sometime after that. And the roadways were constructed in the early 2000s with a base coat of pavement only. Then there was a multi-year economic downturn beginning in 2008. And then in 2010, developer Doug Cole passed away. So these events delayed both the construction of new houses and the completion of the roadway paving. The developer, Tofino Associates, had constructed the roads, installed the utilities, and put down the base course of pavement. And at that time, the town had a policy of not wanting the top course to be installed until most of the houses were built, because the top course would deteriorate as a result of heavy construction equipment driving over it. However, this sub subdivision took an unusually long time to complete, so there was time for the base course to deteriorate. Lots were sold and houses were continuing to be built. And in 2020, it was determined that much of the base course of pavement had deteriorated beyond repair and needed to be removed and repaved prior to the placement of the final top course of asphalt. The residents of Amherst Hills asked the planning board to become involved during this period between 2015 and 2020 to try to facilitate a solution to the problems. At that time, the, the town was reluctant to consider accepting the roads in such a condition, but the residents were eager to have their subdivision roadways accepted. In, in November of 2020, Tofino Associates hired Warner Brothers to remove and replace the bad sections of base pavement and then to place a top coat of asphalt on all three roadways, with the, exceptions, the exception of the cul-de-sac. So Warner Brothers made repairs to catch basins and holes and other pieces of the infrastructure um, that had been noted by the town engineer on a punch list. Um, some of you will remember, particularly Janet, I'm not sure, and maybe Doug. Um, I think Doug came in at about this time. Um, we, and we took a tour of the subdivision. And at that time, the pavement was in really bad shape and there were collapsed catch basins here and there and other uh, infrastructure problems. But even after the 2020 work, there were still some lingering punch list items um, to complete, including woody growth in and around stormwater detention basins. But since that time, Tofino has completed all of the outstanding punch list items identified by the town engineer, including cleaning out the stormwater structures and removing woody growth in and around the stormwater detention ponds. And most of the lots in the subdivision have been sold and developed with the exception of those along the un uncompleted sub uh, cul-de-sac. Cul so the town's being asked to accept these roadways with the exception of that cul-de-sac. And the town is also being asked to accept the associated wastewater pumping station on Station Road, as well as all cross-country sewer and drainage easements associated with this project. A homeowners association is going to be formed and will be responsible for the operation and maintenance of the two stormwater detention basins once the roadways have been accepted by the town. The town will assume responsibility for the stormwater pipes leading to and from the stormwater detention basins, and the town will also assume responsibility for maintaining the roads once they are accepted by the town. At its February 5th 
2024 meeting, the Town Council voted its intention to lay out the roadways in the Amherst Hills subdivision as public ways. So that's the first step in accepting the roads. And they referred the matter to the Planning Board for its recommendation, which is in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 41, Section 81G through 81I, which you have in your packets. The Planning Board has 45 days from the date of referral um, to offer its recommendation. And after that, the Town Council can vote without a recommendation. Um, the 45 days from the date of referral is March 21st. So if you'd like to make a recommendation, you need to do it before then. The Planning Board's recommendation is non-binding and the Planning Board is not required to make a recommendation. So the Planning Board's meeting tonight to discuss this matter and determine a course of action. And the Planning Board might consider the following actions. Discuss the request and hear from interested parties on the matter. Schedule and conduct a site visit to view the completed roadways. And then have another meeting, a subsequent meeting, and discuss this, their observations about the roadways and hear from interested parties again. And then discuss and vote on a recommendation to Town Council on the adoption of roadways in the Amherst Hills subdivision as public ways. Now that the repairs have been completed and the top course has been installed, the Superintendent of Public Works and the town engineer are in support of the town accepting the roads as public ways. So that's the end of my statement. And I think Ted Parker is here and I noticed that there are some uh, residents of the Amherst Hills subdivision who are also here in attendance. Jim Master Alexis, who's kind of been spearheading this effort on the part of the residents was not able to attend tonight, but um, there are other representatives of the, of the residents here. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Chris. So as I understand it, the residents of the subdivision are in support. Uh, Town Council has indicated a, at least some level of support. The town engineer and, and the, the, the director of public works have all expressed support. Chris, is there anyone who does not support this? that you know of. You are muted. I haven't heard from anyone who's not in support of this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bruce? I read the uh, minutes from the um, period, I guess, uh, slightly less than two years ago. And it seems that the heavy listing has been done on this. Um, uh, and the uh, and, and the but it's taken a while for the the motions and action items that were arose from those meetings of uh, two years ago to be completed and so forth. Um, so I guess I, I'm do we uh, I mean rubber stamping is not something that I'm imagining that one does without I mean rubber stamping without looking at anything. Seems a bit odd, but it almost seems as though this is a perfunctory exercise. Uh, but none, uh, so the question is: Are we? What is the? Uh, is the expectation that we would make a site visit? Uh, well, and so forth, or is or is this uh, really that perfunctory that it's uh, that all that basically there's um, this is just water that's running out the headwall and into the uh, into the river. Uh, Bruce, um, you know, I think, I mean, personally, I think this is a situation where we probably can decide to rubber stamp this or we can just take a pass. But uh, it seems that this is, it, this has been a long time coming. A lot of people have worked hard to make it happen. And uh, I think, you know, everyone's in support of it. So, and as far as making a site visit, Conveniently, Janet McGowan uh, has stopped out there recently. Janet, why don't you tell us what you saw? Thank you, Doug. Um, I think this is my fourth site visit. I think I might. I think I'm the only person on the board that's been there from the very beginning, and so um, so I went and looked at the first. And so the top coat is on. The roads look excellent. They're probably the amongst the nicest roads in Amherst right now. Um, 
And um, the only thing I, I went, I didn't visit both detention ponds because one, I don't know where one is, but I visited the one closer to Station Road and it was, it clearly had, the, it had sort of heavy woody growth. It's cleared out, but it's getting like new woody growth. So I was hoping that that would be cleared again, maybe before the HOA form. So they have kind of a clean slate, but you know, the roads look really good and, you know, I'm sure everybody is feeling good about that. Um, I, I came home on Old Town Road, that was Old Farm Road, that was just a hot mess. So I'm hoping that was just like, you know, a comparison that was sort of just shocking. But um, the roads look good, the work is done. And so I would, I would recommend myself that we vote to um, have the town accept roads. And the, yeah. planning has been, the planning board has been kind of involved in this. So I don't think it's just rubber stamping. Well, it's been a rotating cast of planning board members since 2004 or whatever. Uh, so uh, anyway, Bruce? Um, the only, uh, uh, there was some contention about fencing the uh, detention or retention area. And, uh, and, and the discussion that was reported on from over the, even before the two years ago, I, I fully support uh, the idea that uh, uh, 20 and 30 years ago, it was seen to be necessary to fence these detention basins because they really were ugly ditches and, and they had steep sides and things like that. But the, the change in the way these uh, things have been designed so that they're much shallower and so forth, and fences are, 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 are ugly. They, they really do make it difficult to maintain. They cluster vegetation around them and and they make the, the place unusable. So, uh, uh, but I didn't, uh, I read through there and I didn't see in the minutes from two years ago, a resolution about uh, that, that fence. Some one of the residents felt uh, argued that the fence should be there. Um, uh, Ted Parker made all of the uh, more updated arguments as to why it shouldn't be. Uh, so long as the, the swale is relatively shallow, I would say that we uh, should affirm the lack of need for a fence or at least question whether everybody is also in support of that because that was the only thing that I can see that there didn't seem to have been a resolution positively on. Uh, Chris, do you know if how this fence was uh, resolved? I don't think the planning board took a position on the fence, but the town engineer stated that he didn't think it was necessary. Yeah, I know from my memory of the site visit we took a couple of years ago, um, you know, the one storm basin that I saw, which I think is the same one Janet was talking about close to Station Road, was pretty gradual. It was not a, it was not a space that I felt we needed to fence for public safety or anything. Janet? So it is, it is pretty gradual, and there was kind of a stream of water that goes from like one side to the other. Um, and that looks like it's pretty steady. And so I, I thought, I was assuming animals would be using it to drink from, and I did see some coyote tracks in, in what little snow there was there. So I didn't think it was a danger. I mean, if it was completely full, but it would be as dangerous as any water body that you know you could find anywhere in Amherst. Cause I don't see the need for the fence myself. Okay. Um... So I think the first question is, uh, does the does the board want to schedule another site visit uh, or and come back at a later meeting to discuss and decide whether to make a recommendation or not? Uh, or do, do people feel like we could just proceed this evening, make our make a recommendation and uh, put the issue behind us? Uh, the, the third option is that we make no recommendation at all. Um, so are there any members who, I guess, uh, why, don't, why don't I ask, would, is there anybody that would want to make a motion in one direction or another? Janet. I'm, I'm ready to make a motion, but do we want to hear from members of the public if there's some people from the neighborhood? Yeah, I, I thought that I would ask for that. Okay. Uh, I think we can do that after we have a motion. If well, we could do it now, I mean that's fine. Um, Bruce, uh, I'm supportive of uh, 
uh, letting it uh, uh, ma making no motion either way uh, because the two of you and particularly Janet have reported that everything seems to be in order the uh, the minutes that have been supplied to us and that uh, I've read and presumably others have indicate the same and it's and, and there's no obligation on us to make a a recommendation and it's non-binding anyway so it seems that it's unnecessary we don't have to declare ourselves and i frankly prefer not to declare myself because i only know it's a somewhat vicarious uh position and and given that my judgment is that that we don't need to do anything i would uh, support not doing anything okay fred uh, I would disagree with that um, because if we don't do anything, my understanding would be that the statutory period of time has to uh, reel out until uh, the time comes uh, beyond which the planning board's viewpoint is not recordable. And uh, that may defer unnecessarily any further actions on the part of the council and so forth if there's you know and i i would uh i don't see any reason to introduce that amount of time delay all right so you would support a motion to yeah. to to take a stand of one sort or another this evening i, th I think we should do that okay uh, Chris, is it likely that our if we decide not to take to make to make any sort of recommendation that we would in fact delay town council? Are they likely to pick it up like at their next meeting? If we I don't know what their schedule is, um, they would be reluctant to pick it up before March twenty first if you didn't make any statement right. about it. Right. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'm in that point, in that case, I'm going to go ahead and offer the public a chance to comment on this at this time. So members of the public, we are obviously talking about Amherst Hill subdivision. And if any of you want to comment, this is the time to do it, at least in this meeting. Um, and you would are likely to have three minutes. So when we bring you in to the uh, panel for your comments, Please state your name, your your address, and uh, we will bring you in one at a time. The first uh, hand I see, Pam, is John Kennedy. Hi, everybody. I'm John Kennedy. I'm at 36 Linden Ridge Road. Um, first, I would. Can you all hear me? Yes. Welcome. Uh, yeah. Well, I I just want to thank this board because. As Christine knows and and uh, Janet know, we've engaged with this board a number of times um, over the long course of this saga, and the board has been helpful in in moving this thing along. And I would just be concerned if, in fact, you don't take a position on um, the the acceptance of the roads that it may in some way be perceived as a as a negative. And um, I would also just suggest that although. Not all of the folks who are on the board now are on the board over the course of the time that we engage with the board, that this board has been active in this process. Um, and we're also heartened by the fact that the um, the town engineer um, has fully inspected the roads, the roads, um, at least in our understanding, meet all of the specs that have been laid out by the town. Um, and I think that um, you have a, a, a neighborhood that has, um, you know, been dealing with this for quite a long time, um, we've been engaged with the with the with the planning board and with Tofino on this matter since 2019, but even before that. Um, and we are very very pleased that this thing is about to get uh, resolved in some way or the other. And again, I just think that this board again has been a big part of helping move this thing along. And um, as somebody said on the meeting, these are some of the best looking roads you're going to see in Amherst. And so I would just, you know, humbly beseech you to take this on, make a recommendation and help us uh, get to a, a, a speedy resolution here. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, next we have Jonathan Salvan. Please give us your name and your street address.
I had to unmute first. Surprise. Uh, the Jonathan Salvin, 48 Linden Ridge Road uh, in Amherst. Um, and I will not be as eloquent as uh, John Kennedy, but uh, I would just like to concur. Thank you for your efforts of working with us uh, over time to resolve this. Um, and again, I would like to encourage you to take a position and take a positive position um, so that uh, this moves as expeditiously as possible. Um, Someone did mention the the notion of the of getting the uh, attention basins. Uh, I think it was Janet uh, mode again. I believe that is in fact the case. It's part of our our settlement with Tofino um, that they will get mode one more time, and then it becomes the association's responsibility. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, the third uh, hand raised is from Stephen Kramer. Welcome, Stephen. Please unmute yourself and give us your name and your address. Come on. There um, you go. Now we hear you. Uh, yes, my name is Stephen Kramer. I live at 96 Linden Ridge Road. And uh, I'm really, I'm just going to concur with what the John Kennedy and John uh, Salvin uh just said uh we we are uh we've worked very hard to to get to this point and we're anxious to get to some resolution uh i i i will also mention that you were and uh you had asked about the uh the fence around the detention pond and i believe the residents have have agreed to to go with uh the town engineer's recommendation of no fences. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kramer. Okay. Um, so we have a couple, Some one member wanted us to take no position tonight and at least one member sounded like he did want us to take a position. So I will, entertain a motion if anybody wants to raise their hand. I guess before that, I see one hand from the board and one from Nate, Nate Malloy. Nate, do you have anything you want to say before we go further? Yeah, I had looked at the memo from KP Law and, and Fred's correct that the council can't act until the planning board report or the 45 days have lapsed. So the planning board does, you know, if you would like to have a, you know, an action be taken sooner then you need to have a vote and uh, recommendation and then, you know, we can put that into report for the council. Okay. Uh, Bruce. Uh, uh, based on uh, comments, I'm no longer of the opinion that I voiced about uh, 15 minutes ago. Uh, I suppose that could be followed by a motion to... Uh, um, recommend. Up, uh, motion to recommend adoption. Uh, the recommend the adoption to the town. Uh, the, the recommend. I think it's uh, acceptance. The... We're going to recommend acceptance. acceptance of these roads as public ways. So moves. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Karen. A second. All right. Okay. Board members, anybody want to talk about this topic? Comments? Concerns? Okay, uh, one last opportunity for the public to comment if there's any other members of the public. Okay, so we uh, have a motion and a second. I guess we will now have a vote uh, and a positive vote is to recommend acceptance of these three roads as public ways by the town council. Okay, we'll start with you, Bruce. I approve. And Fred. I approve. Jesse. Approve. Janet. Approve. Karen. I approve. And I approve as well. 
six votes in favor, one member absent. Well, so we can not have that on our on a future meeting agenda for the first time in 20 years. Okay, Chris. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for um, spending so much time on this topic and finally bringing it to a resolution. I'm really happy at the outcome. Thank you. Okay. And thank you to all the residents and other members who uh, kept the pressure on and hopefully everything works out from this point forward. Okay, so the time now is 712. And we'll go on to the next item on our agenda. So this is uh, number four, it's University Drive Potential Housing Overlay Zone, where we continue discussion regarding concept for an overlay zoning district to allow more housing with a mix of apartment buildings and mixed use buildings and ideas for streetscape design. So I believe it was sometime this afternoon that Chris, you sent uh, some uh, material to the board in preparation for this discussion. Uh, my guess is it came from Nate uh, or originated with Nate. So uh, Chris or Nate, do either of you wanna lead this discussion? I would love to have Nate lead this discussion. Sure. Thanks, everyone. I'm Nate. The um, yeah, the document's a draft uh, amendment. Staff's also looking at it, so you know this is something that you know hopefully the board can respond to and we can have comments on. I just wanted to say that you know we're proposing an overlay zone, and so the base zoning remains in place. So the office park, limited business. There's also a second overlay research and development on the west side of University Drive, which can remain or we could vote, you know, if we wanted to remove it. And so um, in any in any case, I, I think it's important because uh, there's been some comments saying, that, you know, there's concern about the loss of, say, um, office space or other things. And so an overlay zone would allow all those uses to occur. Right. So we've had the R&D overlay in place for years. The other zoning has been in place for years. And we're not taking it away unless someone wants to. Uh, that's the benefit of, a, of an overlay. You know, if we think that we want to leave the existing zoning, the base zoning in place, uh, we can. An overlay is, is um, in one of the comments that came in, a few say that, oh, it's getting complicated. But overlay zoning is, you know, a pretty um, standard way to, to zone. Um, you know, for instance, if we were to change this zoning and say, well, typically you would use what you have in elsewhere in town. And so if we're saying the limited business doesn't work, you know, is it then BVC or general business, you know, it's downtown. So we wouldn't, you know, it's unless we create a whole new zone district for this area. And so to me, an overlay is really the appropriate tool. Um, and then, you know, with that, we can have different standards and conditions and definitions uh, than what we have elsewhere. And so it only applies in the overlay. That's another nice way to go about it because if we change the base zoning and you want to have say apartments without caps on the units we can't do that you know unless we have a whole new definition of apartments specific to that zone and it you know it really has ripple effects so again an overlay zone we keep the base zoning in place it's a it's an you know a voluntary use of it and so you know someone can choose to use the overlay or not and so i think that's the benefit of of using it um i'll share my screen I think that's it. The uh, as was kind of voted on previously, the overlay would just be south of Amity Street, uh, and then you know the the property is outlined in black here on either side of University Drive uh, to Northampton Road. So it wouldn't include you know south of this. This map hasn't been updated, but so really, it's just this area that's zoned office park and limited business along University Drive. Um, and so, you know, the when we originally proposed, you know, I said, I'd like to see 2000 beds and a lot of housing. And I just wanna repeat that as well, because I think this is a really important place where we could have density and infill. Maybe, 
you know, 2000 beds is, is, is too much, but, you know, I don't want to lose sight that there is an opportunity here to have, um, you know, development and hopefully relieve some pressure elsewhere in town. Right. So we need housing for all types of demographics, household sizes and different types. And so this overlay is really, you know, could help achieve that. Um, if we look at what was proposed, uh, we'd insert this in section three in the zoning bylaw. And so it's really written in kind of the format that's there. So there's a general statement, you know, really we're saying that it's superimposed, it's an overlay superimposed over the areas we just described. It's only apartments and mixed use buildings would, you know, would be applicable in this overlay district. Uh, it has its own dimensional standards, conditions and design guidelines. And then the purpose here, you know, there's a number of things written here and, you know, we can modify this. I think this is where, you know, it's been tweaked a bit saying it's for economic development and expand housing opportunity. And so really you want the purpose of an overlay to be pretty clear. You can expand upon it, but that helps, um, you know, legally, if your purpose is then reinforced by say the dimensional standards or standards and conditions, you want all those to be somewhat consistent. So we're saying this is to encourage economic development and expand housing. Um, you know, the design standards and guidelines are really to, you know, you know, it says intended to foster development that enhances pedestrian experience along the street, allows for street trees and stormwater management, provides spaces for commercial and retail uses, and results in architecture that maintains a scale and character appropriate for an entry into the town and university. Uh, you know, I, I even say the access drive on the west side of University Drive is envisioned to be discontinued for vehicular use and become a multi-use path. And so, you know, this could become a bulleted list or a different narrative, but really kind of outlining the purpose of the overlay. Um, the establishment of it here, uh, you know, again, refer, can refer to the map. And then we get into kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it with dimensional standards. And so we're saying that in this overlay, we're not gonna to refer to table three, we would use what's here. Um, we're saying there's no provision to waive the standards. So there's no footnotes or anything. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're saying there's no minimum lot area requirement for additional units, you know, no 2,500 square feet or 4,000 or whatever. And what we'd rely on then is the building coverage and lot coverage, right? So um, we're proposing a maximum building coverage of 60% and lot coverage of 85, you know, a lot area or frontage, there hasn't been any determination um, what that could be. And so that's something that could be discussed. You know, for setbacks, they're pretty similar, um, but really, you know, if we're having taller buildings and we'd like to maintain room for pedestrian space, you know, we're proposing, you know, 20 to 25 foot front setbacks. Um, you know, the side yard is 10 feet, rear yard is 10 feet. Uh, you know, and sometimes in zoning districts, you might have a minimum building height or a maximum. Right now we're proposing a maximum of five floors uh, and 63 feet. It could be maybe 60 feet is probably sufficient, honestly, with some of the newer buildings we see that are five floors. They're, you know, 57 to 58 feet. They ask for a waiver from what is our current um, height and feet by, you know, a foot and a half. And we allow that. And so, you know, it's, you know, we can consider how we want, what we would want a maximum height to be. Um, you know, and, and for the building and lot coverage, we looked at the other zoning districts in town, you know, and some lots may have more lot coverage actually than 85%. And they'd be considered pre-existing, non-conforming to a point where they could still, you know, extend beyond the 85%. Um, for standards and conditions, uh, the building commissioner has recommended that we not reference the 3.323 or the mixed use one and actually just say this is a new definition. Um, and so we're saying that apartments would be allowed by site plan review in the overlay. They're not allowed within a certain distance of the intersection. Right now it says 300 feet. Uh, they're shall not be located closer than 250 feet measured from building to building. Um, there's no limit to the number of dwelling units in an apartment. Um, there could be multiple ones on a property. And then right now we have this requirement for additional uh, minimum landscaped areas uh, in the, as a standard of condition in the, in the use chart. And we would not have that apply. Uh, and then we have this requirement here um, 
we'd still want the mix of bedroom sizes and then you know with additional provision of 10 percent being three bedroom units or larger and so uh you know we talked about maybe having apartments be special per by special permit or trying to limit them and so you know the building commissioner thought and we you know we had mentioned this a few times that maybe this distance requirement is a way to do it as opposed to making it by special permit really you know we want to encourage housing here and it can be apartments or mixed use and so if we're limiting it um you know, this could even be like 500 feet from the intersection this could be 300 feet but we could have some distances so that you know depending on where the first one is permitted you know then it limits the number of apartments in the overlay and this is a way to do it as opposed to saying let's make it a special permit and not restrict where it could be um you know, especially if we're trying to get density here, it, it would seem strange to have it, have it be a discretionary permit. Um, mixed use buildings, we, you know, some of these, it's similar to what's already in the bylaw, site plan review, we do have 50% gross floor area. Um, it's like half and half, right? So 50% of the first floor should be non-residential use, you know, so basically commercial retail, some, some use other than parking. And it should be, uh, distributed, um, it could be along, distributed along any floor, as long as most of the ground floor facing the street is not that, that non-residential use. So without saying a depth of 30 feet, we're saying that a majority of the streetscape, the street facade on the first floor has to be a non-residential use. And at least 50% of the floor area has to be that. So, um, you know, someone will work with the numbers. It, it may end up being more, but it can't be less than 50%. Um, and again, kind of the many buildings on a property and this provision of 10% of dwelling units. Signs, we might strike this language because we just use the current sign provisions in the bylaw. And so we don't necessarily need to mention this. Uh, project open space, there's a, a number of things here um, to talk about, you know, usable open space for residents and the public. We're saying, Right now, you know, 20% of the building footprint should then be, that's the calculation that would be required project open space. And most of it needs to be uh, um, designed as a courtyard or plaza. Um, we're saying that the front setback on the west side of University Drive is meant to encourage the multi-use path. And we'd want that to be 10 feet, which could also be part of this project open space. Uh, you know, I, I think there's some things here we're saying, you know, project open space can include landscaping, but not 20% of the total area. Um, you know, sidewalks and plazas are also required. And so some of it would be, you know, we'd have to run some numbers to see, you know, what does that mean really? So if a building is 10,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet, then, you know, there's so much project open space and then some of it can be landscaping and, you know, what does that mean? Um, but it's really trying to require some open space. Uh, and I think this, this is important because right now I think the planning board struggles with, you know, how, how do we, what do we do with the build, you know, so if we have a maximum lot area and a maximum building area and what's left with the rest of the space. And so, you know, it's hard to say with our current bylaw that we want, we're requiring plazas or usable space. And I think in this overlay, we want to have some language that we want that. And, you know, some of these bullets could be modified, but it's really allowing the permit granting authority to say, you know what, we're, it could just be really, if we could just have a few bullets, but I think it's really important to say we, there is some provision of a requirement of it. Maybe we don't say how much exactly, but if we, if we at least have this first bullet here, you know, this could allow the, the planning board or whatever, whoever the permit granting authority is to say, what is that space and how usable is it? And so, we don't really have a provision like that in the bylaw. Um, I'll just walk through this and then we can always go back to it. Parking. Yeah, yeah, that's good, Nate. I... All right. Yeah, parking, we're saying um, 7.000. Uh, it's for dwelling units, including apartments. We're saying that in this district, there's a minimum of half a space per unit, uh, but then all other provisions of Article 7 apply. So, you know, landscape and design standards, and the, um, you know, I call this out specifically because um, we have we have standards for the number of parking spaces for retail and office use. And so, you know, if we're if we want fifty percent of a ground floor to be 
mixed use and we require 3.3 spaces for every thousand square feet. And then all of a sudden we have so much um, non-residential space, we're then having, you know, some provision of a certain number of parking spaces. And, you know, then, you know, that's just something to consider. So, you know, and then we have a half space here. So someone can run, work with that and then determine, okay, if I have 80 units and so much square feet of this, then how much parking do I need? And it may be that, you know, the parking then will, you all know, have to reduce the size of the development on the property because of the parking requirements. And so, you know, I think that's what happens now, right? We have parking requirements. Um, we do allow the board to waive this if, um, you know, um, this provision of half a space, if there's reason to, right? So in the bylaw, we allow that, that, that provision to be waived. Inclusionary zoning has been modified to say um, for projects with a net increase in units of over 21, that an additional 8% of the units be affordable to households earning 150% AMI or less. And so the current inclusionary zoning bylaw says, you know, for, for this size development, 12% of the units have to be affordable, you know, um, some at 80, per, no more than 80% and then some at 60% AMI. And I'm saying, let's add another 8% unit count onto it up to 150% AMI. 150 is nice because it's calculated by HUD in the same way that 80 is and 60% AMI is. If we had some other number in there, it then becomes um, a calculation on the town. And I'd rather use a, an outside source to do that. than you know, we're trying to have to calculate it every time a project comes in. And, you know, I think this is a way to get units that are not capital A affordable. They're not going to be on the town's subsidized housing inventory, but, and it's something that we would have to monitor locally, but I think it's something that's important. And, you know, people may say that this would deter development, but we could, you know, see what happens. 150% um, AMI is pretty generous and we can get those numbers, but it's something that, you know, is probably less than what the market is is doing right now so you know it couldn't be you know two thousand dollars for a little studio um that wouldn't be you know that's not going to qualify for 150 ami and then we have a, a number of general design guidelines um and some of these picked up on you know the comments that have been made so uh you know doug and jesse bruce uh the public have all provided comments um and you know i after writing this i you know, try to incorporate kind of ideas and what we'd want. And some of this came from the BL overlay that we had proposed a few years ago. But, you know, we're saying that majority of the front facade shall be located along the front setback line to reinforce this edge. Uh, we limit the, num the, the linear feet of blank facades along the street. So you can't just have, you know, a really expansive wall, um, you know, there would be overhanging awnings and projected canopies between the first and second floor and a horizontal sign band. Uh, you know, if a building facade is over 100 feet in length, then it has to, you know, have a six foot change every 80 feet. And so, you know, I, you know, again, some of these numbers could be modified, but it's trying to get at how do you articulate a building? And so, um, you know, a developer may propose something that has this kind of articulation, but some might not. And so, Really, this would be allowing the board to to use this. Um, we're saying the fifth floor should be stepped back from the front facade, and I don't, you know, again, you know, we're saying ten feet from the front. Um, you know, parking lots would not face the primary streets and be located behind buildings or to the side, but at least thirty feet back from the public way, so that if you did have parking along the side of a building, it would still have to be thirty feet back, uh, you know, from the from the public way. Um, to the extent possible, parking lots should be consolidated. So, you know, there's shared parking to minimize pavement and curb cuts. You know, I have this pervious paving is to be utilized. Again, we could say encouraged, but again, it's something that I don't think it's, I think it's hard to require. There's a maintenance to it. I do think it's something that we could have as something we'd want to see. Um, and then, you know, rooftop mechanical would be set back and screened. And then other things not visible from public way. So louvers and mechanical systems 
would not be visible or located in areas that are visible. And, you know, this became apparent on 133 Southeast Street, the newer apartment building. When they were putting the meter bank on the building, they first had, you know, 60 meters right on a, the corner facing the street, right? It was just like, you know, or it could have been um, very visible and it was changed. And so it's not, but, you know, as we were seeing more buildings that are all electric, you know, where do we have the utilities for those? And maybe it's okay if it's on a corner, but do we really want, you know, a hundred meters, you know, occupying the front facade somewhere. And so, you know, I think it's just something we have to be more conscious of for any project. And maybe we start to have some guidelines about that here in the overlay. And so that's, that's it. Um, you know, I think some of it's in the, you know, what does all this mean? Um, you know, what are the lock coverages mean? What do the setbacks mean? You know, when we looked at, when I determined these setbacks, you know, so on Amity Street, 20 feet um, allows space for sidewalks. 24 feet on University Drive uh, allows for that access drive to be, you know, or to have the space to have it be used for a multi-use path. You know, I think we could make it bigger. If you made it any smaller, you're basically eliminating the possibility of saving the trees along the road um, and keeping, you know, having a pedestrian path set back from the road. Uh, same with Northampton Road. The five college realtor building is closer than 25 feet or it's about 25 feet right now. I think it's maybe 20 feet. And, you know, and, and if you want a taller building, I just think it's, you know, it's, it becomes really close to the corner there. Um, so anyways, the, these setbacks are pretty generous given the height of the buildings. Um, you know, side setbacks are minimal to have some open space. And I will share one more thing. Bruce had asked about, um, um, you know, looking at aerial imagery. And so if we look at University Drive, this is from Mass GIS. The, uh, the outlines in green are wetlands, identified wetlands by Mass DEP. So, you know, if you, they have to be ground truths, but, you know, if you're looking, here's um, the corner of the University Drive and um, Amity on the west side. As we're moving south, you know, this is, this wooded area, you can see a stream here, but you know, this is all wetland area. And so, um, and it may even extend beyond that. And so, you know, you're gonna, you, there's limited development potential here. Really what you'd be doing is redeveloping the paved areas. And so, you know, we, in terms of lot coverage or required open space, you know, you're not gonna have a wall of buildings because of the wetlands. Uh, similarly, as we keep going South, you know, wetlands also come, uh, here's um, 101. University Drive. So here, wetlands also come down here and they're across the street. They're on the east side as well. And so, you know, I think the the setbacks could might seem, or the lock coverage might seem generous, but then, you know, there's also other constraints to the development potential of these properties. And so if you have wetlands and stormwater management uh, and what we have here, you know, you're still not going to have the ability to have full build out. So you know, the post office right here, you know, this property looks like it's probably like 90% lot coverage, right? Um, some of these up here are still really high lot coverage. You know, we're proposing less than that just because that is that is a lot of pavement. Um, it actually, you know, the owners probably benefit from it now because um, you couldn't do this, you, know, you probably couldn't do this today with the wetlands. Um, so, you know, this is just, this is a 21 aerial image. And so, you know, the overlay would come down to you know, this intersection and cover these properties. And so again, it's, you know, two uses are allowed in the overlay. It would encourage some infill, you know, it's not trying to say that this would be, you know, something would be demolished. Um, you know, it gives the incentive if there is the possibility to have increased density. And so, you know, it may not make sense for some property owners to utilize this, but we're, you know, the idea would be that some would, could take advantage of it. All right, thank you, Nate. I, there's a lot to chew on there. And um, I think I, I, I'm, I'm happy to have a fair amount of discussion about it this evening, but I want, I, I think I wanna end up with, you know, we'll all go away and we'll be able to review it at our leisure and send comments to Nate so that 
he can come back with the next iteration. And I also, I know we've got members of the public here who are probably interested in this topic. So I will want to have uh, a period for public comment too. So um, let's just go on in with, with board comment um, and uh, see where it goes. I think I will try to break around eight o'clock as we usually do. So we'll have about 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes of comment this e before the break. Yes, just quickly, I guess I would say, um, sorry, uh, just a few things. Yeah, board members make changes. I think we sent a, a, the document in Word so you could track change or yeah. highlight or, you know, make the changes apparent so it's easy. Um, the second thing I was going to say, staff has asked uh, a local architect, you know, if they would, um, you know, do some, um, some build out of a few properties using the overlay. So if we like the dimensional standards, you know, we'd want to engage in, uh, you know, this professional firm we're looking at, you know, or developing a scope of work and, you know, it'd be for a fee, but, you know, pick a few properties and have that be developed with some mock scenarios. And so, you know, to the level of detail where, you know, it makes sense, right? So it's not just a, kind of a blocky SketchUp model, but something that's a little bit more refined and, and you know, um, using, better graphics so that the board can understand what what all the what all this means in terms of the setbacks and design guidelines. So we think that for a, a you know some some small fee it could be really helpful to have that. And um, you know what we you know if we think that the standards seem okay tonight in terms of the dimensional standards and things, we could start getting a, a scope of work together just to see what a cost estimate would be to have that. Okay. And then, sorry, then they, they would come to the board probably two times, maybe we're thinking a few times at the beginning and then at the end to present the concepts and then go back and could refine them. And the idea would be to have something, you know, try to have this worked out in the next, you know, um, three to four months, right? So to have something, I mean, I think it'd be great to have something by July. And, if, and, you know. and these comment, these concepts would be one way in which those, uh, guidelines could be interpreted by, you know, an architect, but it wouldn't be every possible permutation that someone could come up with on every site. Right. And so it could be that if they have three sites, one might be the mixed use building, one might be an apartment, one might be a site that has two mixed use buildings and they've developed it a little differently, you know, but just to see what, what does it mean if, you know, we have, you know, this setback and this many stories and we have to have this kind of facade articulation. The idea is we'd rely on the architects to kind of use their expertise in working with other developers. So what do they see, right? So they might have long facades, but most buildings are probably not more than 65 feet wide if it's a double, you know, double loaded corridor, right? So maybe one building has, um, you know, is smaller or maybe 100% of the ground floor is uh, commercial and it's a smaller building, but then the second building on the site is a bigger mixed use building in the back or or something. And so, you know, they would have some kind of freedom, right, to show what what's possible given the overlay, right? So it's yeah, I don't want to mislead the board or the public and say this is what we'll get with the zoning, right? And so right. it's just to help visualize what could happen. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to be clear that right. You know, if particularly if you take a concept too far, it starts to look really real, and it's like this is what we're going to get. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. Years ago, um, when we, the hills lost were rezoned to neighborhood business, there was a plan in elevation showed at town meeting, and I think everyone thought, oh, we're going to get a Greek revival building, but that was just a again an idea of what could happen if the zoning changed. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't I think it was. Um, you know, some people may have said, wow, that's what we're getting, but that's really what, not what it was. It's just an idea. Okay. All right. We got a lineup of people who want to make comments here. So Janet, you've got here first. Um, the first question, the first thing is I had two questions. Um, were you proposing the overlay district for all of university drive between Amity street and route nine, or were you taking some, some parcels off? I, I couldn't tell. I think you said it sounded so the so so the um, medical buildings and all those things are would be part of it, right? Okay, I just saw like some different thing, 
And then, yeah, so, oh yeah, oh yeah. Sorry, so let me just share my screen quickly. Yeah, it was confusing to me. So the overlay would be in everything outlined in black, you know, north of Northampton Road and south of Amity. So, okay, okay. I just thought it looked like for some reason it looked like the OP was pulled off. Okay, and then so and then there would be an inclusionary zoning requirement of twenty percent over a certain number of units. Is so, that right? Okay. That, that that was okay. So that helps me understand. I was taken, I thought we had sort of take, I thought we had agreed that we didn't really want apartments only on University Drive because I think we should go to four floors and not five. We're already giving extra space, you know, in terms of lot coverage and increased height. But if we go to five stories apartments, I think we're going to just see five story apartments on University Drive. And this is a office space district. It's a you know, it's BL, it's for businesses. And, you know, I think we've seen buildings with barely any, um, you know, commercial space. People just, you know, developers just want to build apartments. So I think that's- Isn't, should... isn't that why we he, he had the spacing requirement in there? Yeah, I just think that people could just build a whole series of, I think we should just take apartment buildings off. Because um, if you have a five-story building, unlimited units, no requirement of front space, that's what we're going to get. And so I think if we want it to be a vibrant commercial area, stay to mixed use, you can put as many units as you want. And, you know, the first floor has to be at least 50% commercial retail, something that somebody, some kind of business of some sort. And so I would really, I think we shouldn't go down the apartment. Uh, I thought that, I thought, I thought that was actually what the board was talking about at the last meeting, but I might not remember that. Um, I think we should stay to four stories. If we go to a fifth story, I think we should really up the inclusionary zoning requirement or require that they be condos or something, you know, that will, you know, long-term residents, we can't have the whole town be filled with rental units, but I think we should stay at four stories. We're giving, developers have more incentive. And if we go to a fifth story, I think we should really ask for something. Um, in terms of parking, our current parking requirement is so flexible. I'm not sure why we have to go to 0.5 parking spaces per unit. I have no idea what the basis for that number is other than people liked it. Um, there's no, I have no data to support that that would be enough or too much. And, you know, our current parking bylaw says, if you can justify the numbers, you can get what you want. And so I think we should just stick with that. Um, I would love to see more details in roofs and not just to have a bunch of buildings with flat roofs. Um, but I do, I do see a lot of good in this and it's, I it really appreciate it, like seeing it on a piece of paper, um, but I do need more time to look at it too. So. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Next was Fred. And I'll try to keep your comments to three minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I like five stories and I have to, ask, uh, you know, if you looked at the Gazette earlier this week, we find uh, Barry Roberts in front of the Z ZBA apparently uh, yeah, asking for a variance that would allow five stories on, at the uh, north end of this space. It almost looks like uh, he was attending the planning board meetings. And uh, I I have to ask to what extent, because the uh, that uh, article in the Gazette gives you a really good idea of what might be possible here. It's a it's a it's a five story proposal. He's asking for a variance. I I am a little surprised that uh, this. Uh, I don't understand how this. Uh, meets the statutory requirements for a variance. But uh, I'm wondering whether he's been in contact with the uh, planning department about uh, what he's coming to the ZBA with and uh, whether the way we're going here might be something that he could, you know, pursue by right as soon as we get to an end point here. So I, I am very curious about that. Thank you. Okay. Um... I, I, before Chris or Nate, I, I ask you to respond to that. Um, I do hope we that the conversation continues to be focused on the uh, this overlay and that we don't get into a discussion about uh, that project that was publicized. 
So Chris and Nate, do either of you want to comment or respond to Fred? Yeah, I, I would say that the zoning board is taking that matter up tomorrow. And if a variance was granted, it might come to the planning board as a, you know, through a regulatory process. And so I don't think we should be focusing on that project. Um, you know, can after, you know, tomorrow night, it could be um, discussed. But, you know, I, I think that, um, yeah, I think that's, I think it's more important to look at, you know, what, you know, what's the intent of the bylaw, or the overlay, and, you know, what do we think we want with it? And so, um, you know, we can't, you know, like I said, I think this is, we'll take a few more months and then we can talk about what's happening on certain properties or projects. All right, Chris. Yeah, I wanted to say that um, I think these two things are happening on parallel tracks. Obviously, Barry Roberts knows about what we're working on here with the planning board, and we in the planning department know what Barry Roberts is working on because he's going before the ZBA, and we support the ZBA's work. We, you know, we help the ZBA do their work. Um, but there's not a, um, how should I say this? We're not like promoting what Barry Roberts is doing through this zoning amendment we've been working on this zoning amendment since sometime well we started thinking about this last spring and we slowly evolved into talking about university drive and the fact that they're both happening at the same time doesn't mean that they're um integrally <coughs> related i guess is what i want to say parallel tracks all right thanks chris uh next comment from Bruce. Um, uh, I can't help saying that uh, uh, Karen and I are on the uh, Local Historic District Commission. I'll, I'll just make this brief before I get to what I really want to ask. And uh, we uh, invited uh, Kurt Three minutes, Bruce to come and uh, uh, talk to us about what his ideas were because he thought he thought that uh, developers might advance our position. So I'm I'm not averse to uh, in the full in the fullness of time to contemplating inviting Barry to help us think through this and others if they're willing. But that's another matter. But that's just what we have done in another uh, town count. Um, the uh, I generally think that most of this is fine. I'll make a bunch of detailed comments or. Um, the the one thing that really doesn't I don't understand here is the maximum building coverage and this might relate to that uh, spreadsheet that I created uh, but it seems to me that you don't need to have the maximum building coverage any more than it currently is uh, or allow it to be any more than it currently is which I believe is thirty five percent because if you're adding twice as many stories or, or let's say more stories, two more stories. Um, the number of uh, square foot of developments possible, the number of uh, housing units that you uh, can, can develop uh, is quite considerable. And if you've got a, a even a small uh, parking generation requirement of half, um, you can't really uh, put the building coverage at much more than about 35% before you find that the consequent parking uh, requirements, unless you allow it to become off-site or something, it, um, it, it, uh, because the parking generation requirement at, uh, at um, half a, um, a space per unit is going to generate about twice the, uh, the site coverage that the building coverage would be. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's it's uh, the only way you could satisfy, or if if you if you wanted to get anything approaching a, a building coverage of sixty percent, you would be necessarily constraining yourself to three stories. So it it seems to me that 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 number is at odds with what we're trying to achieve or what we're allowing folks to achieve, and that's why I it was it was to check things like that that I that I created that spreadsheet because I wanted to see just where. What, what what happens if you made certain assumptions? And that was one that seemed to me to be fairly clear. I didn't think you could fit very much uh, more than half a parking space per 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 unit um, uh, on these sites. And it turns out that that's as far as I can tell from the spreadsheet that I created is probably true. So I wanted to find out whether I'm missing something um, uh, about. Uh, the the, uh, the 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 thought to 
dramatically increase the allowable building coverage. Nate, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, if we're trying to get density, I think 35% is too low. And so, you know, this would be an opportunity where a developer might say, you know, I don't want to have any parking because there's public transit. If it's students, they can go to the university. People can bike. You don't need as many parking spots here. And so, you know, I don't want parking spaces to be the backdoor way to say no to this, right? And so ideally, I would say we have no parking requirements, zero for everything, no parking requirements. We could, we could do that. And the developer would propose what they want. They want to put a restaurant, they put as many parking spaces as they need. They want to put in 100 units, they can put as many parking spaces as they need. And so, you know, I know some developers want one parking space per unit, some might want two, some might want a mix. And so, you know, I think the parking space ratio is is kind of an archaic thing that's been around in zoning, thinking that everyone wants or needs, a, you know, two cars per unit, but I don't think that there's necessarily a right answer. And I actually think that down here, it might be that a developer could propose that they don't need anything, right? There's not a lot of streets nearby to have on-street parking, so maybe they want them, but maybe they say, you know what, my tenants and my leases will actually restrict vehicles. And so then, you know, they might need 50% lot coverage for building or 50% building coverage because they don't want to have all the surface parking. There's the ability to put parking under a building. Um, but I just think that 35% building coverage is, you know, that's really small. So if we're thinking about having this be a denser area, if we looked at what we have in, you know, say downtown or something, that's, you know, we're, we're trying to balance what, you know, what do we allow in other districts? And so 35% just seems, um, you know, too little if, if someone really can have something without much parking. Well, well, so but it seems like, uh, you know, if that's, if that's the approach, then, then we definitely need to look at the parking ratio. And because that sounds like that's actually the governing uh, surface demand based on Bruce's calculations. It, it can be, I think, you know, these are also maximums. And so the idea would be that, I mean, I, I look, looking at the map, there are a few properties that are probably about 50% building coverage right now. And, um, but yeah, it's, you know, someone's not going to build just a massive square building that's, you know, 200 square feet by 200, you know, you know, you just need, you know, an airflow, you need windows. And so to me, it would be, it'd be odd to have a minimum, but then say maybe a footnote if you needed it, you know, so to me, I'd rather have standards that are, that's what they are. And we're not going to have footnotes or the provision to waive them or modify them. It just, it would seem strange to, you know, to have all these, that, those provisions. And so, you know, maybe 6% is, is too much in a, the pre-existing lots that are over 50, if we have 50%, then they can still be over 50 if it, you know, but I'd like to think that we want to encourage, um, you know, infill and, okay. have a, a, you know, bigger coverage. All right. Bruce, anything else before we go on? Uh, um, no, I'll, I'll hold off for the moment. I, I, I think the answer I'm hearing from Nate is that you need to add, you need to go up from 35 if you want to uh, allow for uh, less than five and uh, less than for, for no parking. And, uh, and that uh, retaining 35% would basically be uh, uh, driving um, or anticipating that there would always be some parking. And I guess if that's not true, then I can understand that you wouldn't uh, want to do that. But 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 my basic point to repeat it is that if we're if we're adding two stories to the provision, we're certainly adding density uh, over even the existing uh, the existing coverage. You can get a lot of stuff on there. Um, but I, I hear what you say, Nate, and I understand uh, that that was the answer I was looking for. Okay, Bruce, we can certainly come back to you uh, yep. later. Jesse. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait for them. Great. Thanks, Doug. A um, couple questions and just a clarification, really, for now. Uh, so, Nate, that, that image you just showed with the wetlands, that was really helpful. Could you share that with us as we think about this more? Not, not right now on the screen necessarily. Just could you send that or put it in the packet as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because that actually made me feel a lot better about some bigger buildings, looking at how that's going to limit essentially what's going to become paved and built, right? Well, and and Nate, isn't it true that the green boundaries you showed was the actual wetland and that 
any conservation commission review is going to require or limit the amount of building within what is it a hundred foot setback from those lines so it's actually greater uh, you know in terms of what's not going to be buildable right yeah so that, so that's really helpful just to look at and think about this um and then uh so question about the the access road so that's actually owned by the lots it's not it's not a Visual street, is that correct? Right. So, like, so yeah. And, and then as you've written a lot of the details here, um, the language you're using is encourage or should be, stuff like that. Is there a reason not to have stronger language on things we feel strongly about, like street trees or like the multi-use path? Can we require those rather than encourage them? And what are the downsides in your view of doing that? Yeah, that's a good question. Staff some staff had pointed that out. Um yeah, I, I don't think it's, I think, um, yeah, I think some areas we could require, I think sometimes it's hard to say, you know, acquiring pervious pavement or something, um, but maybe in some others we could. The, I think with the, um, the access drive, it's hard because there's easements over those, they're privately owned, and then there are multiple properties share the easements so they can access them. And so, you know, um, there's a few property owners that they could, probably say we'll make another curb cut and then extinguish the easements but at some cases it might be tricky legally to have you know a number of property owners agree um so i don't know if we can require that that be reused as a pedestrian path but okay. so you know the requirement for street trees right we could say that uh you know we could you know my hope would be say for that access drive to encourage it to become a multi-use path and we have the setbacks to do that and then you know um, the town will probably have to negotiate some easements there that, you know, for it. But I think it, you know, it's hard because it's outside the right of way, you know, the, the right of way in university drive is really wide, but most of it is off the road on the East side. And it's pretty close to the curb edge on the West side. And so, you know, if we had a generous right of way with, then we could have, you know, we could have some different language, but I think because it's on private property, I, I have right, you know, that kind of encourage or the, not the requirements that it be so. Um, okay, great, thanks. Okay, Karen. Yeah, so I, I agree with Jesse, seeing all the wetlands made me realize that we really haven't got, I mean, it was daunting in a way because it made you realize that the uh, the density that we're going to get there is not is limited in another sense we're going to have enough open space because of all these wetlands uh, i've been looking at five stories as opposed to four stories going to northampton counting the uh, the five stories next to the four stories and seeing that the five stories often are recessed and i also think we should allow five stories we really want to get as much density in as possible. And then if you have five stories that allows the developer to do, to have more open space to kind of make it more attractive. I liked um, you sent these design guidelines that were developed by the consultants that we hired for Milton. And I started to read that and I was especially uh, intrigued and impressed with one of the concepts which was develop first the pedestrian way. Think of how you're going to have the flow of the pedestrians. Have that be a prime thing to start off with and then um, go from there because I think that that's what we're all aiming for is to have density in a place where we really have encouraged pedestrian walking and bicycling. So that's one of the first things we should think about is how are we going to really have this be a prominent feature? And it already is with, with the treescape. Um, yeah, so, and as far as the parking concept, I've changed a lot that too. I, I read that book, um, Paving Paradise, and there's going to be that conference in Boston that I'm hoping to go to. And it really opened my eyes to the fact that we have to get off of this idea of uh, mandating a lot of parking, that the less parking that you provide, the more you're really, I mean, there's 
it, it kind of forces the kind of infrastructure that we want to develop. And especially at a university, you're a town where you're so close to, to things. You could have, I mean, if there's a real problem getting around, you could so quickly put pressure to have some trolley going back and forth. So I think it's really is a good thing to have uh, to limit it the requirement to 0.5. If of anything, I kind of agree with Nate, maybe we should get rid of the parking mandate altogether in this particular place. Thanks. Okay, Karen. Janet. Um, so just quickly on the parking front, um, I would not, if we want families and you know working adults to live in this area or have the opportunity to do, to do that, if there is no parking, there will be no families. And I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody who doesn't have a car in the valley that can afford one. And so I, but I also think is, you know, at night, the big wide parking lot is available. Same thing is true for um, the university. Um, I don't know if it's the urgent care on University Drive. There's a lot of a parking that's available at night. And that our current bylaw talks about shared parking. And so I, I really think that our current, sorry about the cat, the current provision of the bylaw gives a lot of flexibility, but it's not, it's not like this idea of like, oh, we don't want anyone to have a car, but I have one. I mean, if everybody wants to give up the car and the planning board and see how that goes for them, that's fantastic. But I just don't think we can take an ideal and attach it to zoning. I mean, the other thing is, you know, you're kind of like, oh, I'd like to get rid of parking altogether. Why are we just let them build a 20 story building on University Drive? Like you can't argue for the zoning you like and then say, well, let's just throw it out here. It's I think these are sort of things that we have to really consider and think like, how do people live? What do they need? There is nowhere around here for people to park other than on Amity Street and that's where they go. We have learned from the buildings downtown that a lot of those people have parking permits and they're parking in the neighborhoods. And so, um, let's just, you know, so I, I, I think it's possible to do shared parking. There's, I'm very flexible on it, but the idea of like, oh, let's get rid of parking. We're not Manhattan, you know, <laughs> and how people live and what do we want to encourage, you know? So anyway, that's the first thing. The second thing is I have a question about the wetlands and several people have talked to me about this recently. Um, and that map that you showed, there's, this is, this is probably an area that probably was just a giant wetland and probably should never have been developed, right? And so I think, you know, Nate sort of alluded to that. So I'm wondering now, like, what is developable? Like, if if we, are these, will these wetlands be mapped differently? Or is there a way that development around them has to happen in a way that takes care of them? Or there's like best practices? And I was wondering if we get more information about the wetlands, and I was kind of wondering if Aaron Jake or somebody could look at this and say, you know, these current lots could be built on or, you know, looking at what we're looking at, um, maybe not. And I know Barry Roberts in his ZBA application was saying there's a high water table, there's more wetlands, and also it all looks very different. So I just kind of feel like we need more information on that. I'm not sure how to get that. But I think if we're going to proceed with an idea of density in an area, can the area support that? Or are there constraints? Okay, Janet. Um, I guess I, I, I feel the need to say, Janet, that I don't think we're talking about getting rid of parking. We're talking about getting rid of parking requirements, which would leave it to the developers to decide how much parking they wanted to provide. Well, why not? Why have any setback? Why don't we just let them pick the setback they want or the heights they want or the lot coverage they want? Like, why have zoning? I mean, we're well, trying to create a livable place for people. And we're thinking, oh, it's good to have space in the front and shopping in the front. And we're going to require these things. So I just don't know how people pick and choose. But I think it's, you should pick and choose on, like, what's going to happen in 20 years. Or if you want an apartment building filled with students or people, what are, you, what are we looking for? All right. Well, okay. Uh, say on the wetland piece, you know, most of this would be a redevelopment project, so they couldn't expand the existing pavement or you know, pervious areas or disturbed areas, and then you know, with the groundwater, so stormwater management becomes, you know, kind of a uh, an engineering exercise, and so 
you know, to me, what that means is redevelopment is expensive here. And so you possibly want if a five, you know, five floors in greater density. Otherwise, there's no incentive to spend the, you know, the money dealing with all that if you can't, you know, get density, right? So if you're gonna spend a lot of money trying to manage stormwater with a new project and you know you can only get two stories and you know 20% building coverage, I don't think many property owners would would do that. And so um so yeah, so I, I think we can have Aaron do some more, but you know, I was gonna share my screen again. Um the uh so for instance on say if we zoom in on this property you know if the edge of pavement is here and here you know what they oh, i can annotate here um you know if this is edge of pavement you know that's that's the extent of what can be redeveloped right so they 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 can't you know, if say this were all green space, there's a little bit of green space here. They can't then pave that because it would be within the wetland buffer, but they can use whatever is already disturbed. The difficulty would be then how do you manage stormwater, you know, pre and post stormwater. So uh, here is different, right? So here's green space. And so the difficulty would be if you're proposing a building here, you know, what does that mean in terms of wetlands, you know, your buffer, your impact and your stormwater management, you know, it could be done. It just becomes a lot more complicated than if it were already paved. And so, you know, um, if we uh, if we move down on the site, you know, the site down here, you know, again, it's what's already disturbed and what's the limit of that disturbance and how does it, you know, what's the wetland boundary? And so that becomes really the kind of the guiding some of the guiding factors. And we could have, you know, Aaron maybe write some bullet points up, but. Um, yeah, I think that becomes a, a really big piece there. Okay, Nate. Uh, Bruce or Chris, actually, do you want to interject anything that's about yeah, something been said here? I do. I wanted to say that um, the map that Nate is showing is a state map, and it's not based on on the ground surveying of wetlands. And I know for a fact that there are more wetlands than are shown on that map. And I know Nate knows that too. So it's an approximation of where the wetlands are. Um, anytime that there's a project anywhere near wetlands within a hundred feet of wetlands, we of course have to involve the conservation commission. So that's kind of a limiting um, factor on all of these properties. And I don't think the zoning needs to um, accommodate the wetlands. The, the wetlands are accommodated by very strict state regulations and town regulations, and those will come into effect when a property is being considered to be developed. And they're all considered differently. As Nate was describing, properties that are already um, disturbed are considered differently from properties that are not disturbed. So it's it's really impossible to predict anything about the wetlands uh, unless you have mapped the wetlands on the ground and you know exactly where they are and know what category of the regulations you fit into. So in my opinion, yes, we can involve Aaron in this conversation, but I don't think that we should let that the fact that there are wetlands here limit what we're trying to do in terms of zoning because it will be limited by the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Bruce. Um, uh, why don't we, I'm gonna let Bruce and then Janet and then we'll take a break. Okay. Um, I think I've, uh, under standards and conditions, starting at the uh, halfway down page two, I. I think I now understand that uh, there are apartment uses and there are mixed use buildings. And I think in my general understanding, as we've been talking about this for the last six months, I guess I have to confess that I had really only ever had in my head mixed use buildings. And, and so um, I think I now understand that I didn't realize that this mouse was crawling under the door here. Um, that um, because I guess because I've got all sorts of things and questions about these apartment uses but I hadn't really re read and registered that it was a whole different 
type of uh, of use. So I guess my question is, why do why not just allow mixed use buildings here? And in fact, uh, because it seems that's that gets us everything we want, including including a, 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 a commercial retail presence on the first floor, at least 50% of it, and at the front, which we've repeatedly said. I mean, multiple people here have repeatedly said. So everything that we've repeatedly said seems to drive multi-mixed-use buildings. So I just, I just don't understand why we've got apartment uses in here. Is there a reason that we have apartment uses in here? How does that not frustrate uh, what we've basically been describing as what we want to have here? All right, Nate. Yeah, I actually think that um, we'd want some apartment buildings because we want residential units. I think if, you know, what we're doing with mixed use buildings is we're getting the space for uses. It doesn't mean it's going to be filled, right? So I think there are some developers who will work hard to find uses for to fill those that 50%. I think there are other developers who would take it like happens now and the space will be vacant for three years. And so the zoning isn't saying we're going to get, you know, an ice cream shop or offices or restaurants. It's saying we're going to have the space set aside for that. And, you know, if we have those dimensional standards in terms of, you know, cannot be allowed within so many feet of each other, or maybe it's 500 feet of the corners, you know, we could go through an exercise and say, I was just doing that during the meeting. If, if it's 500 feet from the intersections, if we say that, we change it and we say, okay, this property is developed. You know, we end up getting maybe two apartment buildings on the west side of University Drive. To me, two apartment buildings is fine. I don't know why we need all mixed use buildings. I think having, you know, different building types is, is you know, is okay. That actually would add to the vibrancy. You get the density and the number of people so that the mixed use building spaces then can actually have uses in them. And so, I actually think that, you know, if this were in place, the first few projects might have mixed use buildings and maybe no uses until all, all of a sudden there's enough residents that someone's like, you know what, I actually will put a restaurant in here. But maybe the first, you know, they're going to wait till you have the density and the number of people to support that. And so I think apartments is, you know, if we want this to be actually housing, I think we want apartments. I disagree with you, Nate, uh, because basically you've got four and a half floors of housing in the mixed use uh, development and the front half of the uh, first floor, if it is open, if it is vacant for a long time, it eventually becomes, as you say, a restaurant or whatever the hell when the, when the critical mass is accrued. And over the lifetime of what we're trying to do here, the first five or 10 years is not in, well, the first two or three years is inconsequential. So I, I, I strongly disagree. I think that, uh, this is probably going to be some predominantly housing because that's, I mean, that's probably what's going to happen, but it may not. And that wouldn't be terrible because this is predominantly a, um, a commercial district now. And we're trying to imagine how a preponderance of housing can arrive there. And I think the mixed use formula gets that and gets it in spades. And the fact that it gets it to 85% and not 100% really uh, is is not a problem for me in fact it's it's a problem if it goes that way because i think now you you we we want to preserve some fractions of that uh or the length of that street for retail commercial use and that vitality and then having blocks of residential apartments right on the street is kind of for me you know, it's just uh, a certain level of abhorrence i hate the idea of that i don't like it at all and i so I anyway, so you can work to convince me on that, but basically I would strike the apartments. Sure. I was also going to say that if we require every building to be only mixed use buildings, we've had a few cases where they don't actually have a lot of frontage, but we're requiring so much of their ground floor to be non-residential space. And so you have, you know, a narrow building that goes deep into the lot, and now we're saying half of it has to be non-residential space and has not much frontage. And so to me, you're limiting kind of the creativity that could happen on a pro on a property. You're actually be limiting how many buildings you'd have because, you know, on the back of a property, you might just have then the whole street lined with buildings that are mixed use, but then the back of it where you could maybe have an L or a second building, someone's not going to do it because they're not going to want to put 50%, you know, have mixed use building space behind 
off the street. And so yeah. I think requiring only mixed use buildings uh, could actually limit what kind of creativity and development we see down here. Well, Unless you're going to have some, you know, some provision that if it's a mixed use building in the back is to reduce square, you know, square, you yeah. know, percentage on the first floor or something. Well, well, this is certainly your wheelhouse and not mine. Uh, but I, I, I've got, uh, I've got a whole bunch more arguments to throw at you, and no doubt you've got a whole bunch more to throw at me. And maybe now's not the time. But, but, uh, but this, this is, um, I'm, I think you're going to have a hard time convincing me that apartments are a good idea here, notwithstanding all that you've currently said. Okay, okay, Bruce. Uh, Janet, you're last, and then we'll go to a break. You know, I thought at the last meeting there was consensus amongst the planning board that we wanted mixed use buildings. So I, I kind of feel like we're going over ground that we talked already. And so, I mean, I'm assuming the this overlay district is our recommendation or this is our kind of concept piece. And, you know, this will be shopped around to different stakeholder groups and things like that. But I do think um, I do. I agree with Bruce. I just I you know, it's. So I just I think if you if you allow apartment buildings, you're going to have five story apartment buildings everywhere you could find it. Um, I do have a question, though, about getting back to the wetlands. So I know those delineations, that, that little green line isn't like scientifically exact. Is that the delineation of the wetlands or the wetlands plus the buffer? Nate, I, I it's, just, it's just the it's wetlands. Just the, it's a, an approximation of the wetlands, not any. Is that like. Okay, so I, I do think I'd like Aaron Jakes to take a look at that because I know that sometimes even when you have a paved parking lot, you know, one of the wetlands goes right up there that maybe the Conservation Commission would want a buffer. So I just think it'd be great to have her input in terms of like, what's the land's capacity to do this or what, you know, we our lots could be shrinking or not, you know, because things change. But I just think it'd be great to use her if, you know, get her input on to the board in some way. Okay, Janet. Karen, can it wait until after the break or not? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank time, you. Time is 8.18. We'll take a five-minute break and come back at 8.23. Thanks.
Um, Doug? Yes, Janet. Um, I am probably going to sign off after we finish University Drive. Okay. Um, and then I, I have only one question about um, the, um, uh, the design guidelines, which was like, what was SK1, 2, and 3? But I could just ask Chris that some other time. On the on the flow chart, I just didn't understand what that was. Okay, but all right. I, I get a, I'm still getting over my COVID, which seems almost permanent at this point. So. Oh, sorry to hear that. Well, my my days of glory and activity seem to be over permanently. Oh, really, <laughs> that's too bad. No, it's okay. It's okay. So it's just it's you know I have to sort of pace myself. Okay. All right. Well, I'll try to notice when you bow out and we'll try to note that time. <clears throat> Haven't forgotten you, Karen. I'm going to put my vest on. It's cold in here. Excuse me. Oh. Well, you're always outdoors, Chris. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. it. Looks like we lost Bruce and Nate. Ah, oh, there's Bruce. That's Bruce. And I don't really want to continue this conversation without Nate, so. See if he wants to come back and, and get more uh, comments from us. <laughs> Sometimes he has to uh, wrangle his dog while we take a break. Oh. Okay. That's right. I remember last time that happened, he was late yeah. back because of uh, his whatever. dog. Dog. That I'm, if I can, while we're waiting, I'm not sure that uh, my spreadsheet is going to be that important for discussion. I wonder whether it couldn't just be sent around and people can figure it out for themselves and figure out whether it's useful. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'd be happy to show it, but I don't want to take up time necessarily. It, since you sent it out to uh, Chris and Nate and me. You know, I thought you'd at least want to share something about that investigation. Oh, absolutely. I think it was very it, it was helpful for me to to 
to, to figure out how these variables were. Okay. And I felt that well, then, I felt know, that that could be done without drawing it. I felt it could be done simply using numbers. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then, then Chris, uh, you know, I think you could take Bruce's email with his uh, spreadsheet and just send it around to the board. You are muted, but I think I know. Yeah. And then you'll tell me when, whether, when you want me to put it on the agenda. Is that right? Well, it sounds like uh, Bruce is not sure we really need it on the agenda. Well, it's it, in my in my architectural uh, partnership. We had three of us, and and uh, one of us was called numbers, one of us was called words, and one of us was called pictures. And and uh, and we realized that in any given moment of uh, design process or communications. Um, one of us was better suited to making the case. And in this case, it would have been numbers, which was not me, it was Mark. But uh, I, it seemed to me that numbers was an important uh, way of getting some broad understandings. And, and that's why I also wanted pictures, which was the, the image that, that Nate showed, which I'd asked for, because I thought that would be helpful. And so mm -hmm. in a similar way, I think numbers would be helpful. We've spent most of our time with words. So I, I provided numbers and Nate did a picture and I guess we're going to do more pictures with um, Ken Riddle and whomever. Yeah. But you can take this spreadsheet and you'll see that there are different cells that are uh, yellow and those are numbers that can be adjusted. And if you adjust them, uh, the numbers in blue in other cells will change and you can try various assumptions and you can change from one parcel to the another. You can put in different parcel areas based on the property data that's there available. And uh, and then try, for example, what happens when you have different uh, um, assumptions relating to parking generation or units or numbers of floors and all that sort of thing. And you can see whether you learn anything. All right. I appreciate the time you spent on that, Bruce. Mm. All right. Well, let's see. Maybe I think maybe last time I did this. Oh, here's Nate. Nate, did you did you get your dog taken care of? It's my dog and my daughter. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just about to suggest we go on to a couple of our routine things later in the agenda and then come back. Oh no! I, was, I, I yeah, I was here. I heard Bruce. Um, okay. I think right, yeah. He was he was talking about his spreadsheet. Yeah, I was going to say I think that um, when we work with the architect, the hope is that they bring you know they have they'll will have they'll have a plan a site plan with some metrics and they'll kind of use like I said their expertise to generate what could be a concept design in terms of you know number of parking spaces open space and then you know building footprint and size and so I think the difficulty is you know we've you know, we took what were dimensional standards and staff, we could say, well, here's what a typical building might look like. And it becomes like a rectangle on a plan. But, um, you know, a developer might not really use that model, right? They might come up with something else, depending on what kind of use they want or parking or how they envision it. And so I, I, I understand what Bruce is saying, it's really hard to, to visualize and to understand what does the dimensional standard mean in terms of uh, the built environment. And I think that's where, you know, working with the architect can help. You know, we can also come up with different models and thoughts, uh, but it's, well, it's really Nate, difficult. I mean, you mentioned potentially having them do two or three different parcels. Right. But you could also look at it as doing one parcel under two or three different assumptions about, right. you know, the number of parking requirements or the you know the the lot coverage and so that we can see how the numbers we put in produce different physical results um you know that might be equally it might be even more useful than looking at three different parcels i don't know so um i promised karen she would be next so karen you you are Thank there you go. So I have a question. Um, if you're proposing this to be apartments and mixed use, 
does that mean that the developer gets to decide or then then we have no control as Janet said over uh, maybe everybody just going to put apartments in how does that get decided on the other hand I really do understand that there might be pieces of land in this difficult um, wetland uh, area that an apartment building an attractive apartment building would be desirable and you know one of the goals is that we want to encourage families also to have a place in Amherst that can't afford houses plenty of places where where young families love living in apartments and create an apartment house with the, that's affordable that isn't um, a house but that's a wonderful place for young families to, to live uh, and so I, I think we shouldn't just completely rule out uh, the suggestion that some of these areas might be preferably to be all apartment houses. But my question is, uh, how do you how do you then limit that this isn't all going to be apartments? Uh, Nate, uh, you know, without I guess I'll put words in your mouth. Isn't that what the distance requirements were? Uh, to, to limit the number, the, the frequency of apartment buildings. Right, so if we, you know, uh, if we said that, um, you know, say 400 feet from the intersection, sorry, I'm in my draw tool. Um, let's move this. <clears throat> um, you know, so then these two properties, say these, they're, this, these two properties could, could only be mixed use buildings. And then if we had a distance requirement of um you know a few hundred feet then all of a sudden say this one property can be developed as an apartment building and then with the next distance requirement you know in the wetlands all of a sudden it becomes you know maybe this property and then it you know and then maybe you know one other property and so that's how the distance requirement would work right and then if you can't be within so many feet of the other intersections then you so really you know um the inner the distance from the intersection would be the the first parameter and then it's really about what is the first apartment building developed and then you'd have these buffers around it and so right i mean i think and there's a few different ways that that could happen but that's how that would work right so if we follow that scenario down maybe you'd get three apartment buildings on the west well, side of university drive seven, yeah i mean 70 university drive is already all apartments right uh it has a very small mixed use component oh really so it's a mixed use okay yes. okay um bruce uh, i was going to ask uh, whether we would consider uh, eliminating the side yard setback requirement uh because i thought but i see it's only 10 feet so probably you, know, you certainly probably be getting cars through there so uh and and then i look at the map and the wetlands and so forth and i think that uh I've 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 just done a a, a, a a site design in my head, and it, I think it's irrelevant. So, but the the idea of getting buildings close together and and pretty much attached along that uh, strip, particularly if we've got, um, um, I'll say what I was going to say. The the uh, the, uh, the mixed use would put a lot of people in have in a residential habitation along that. Uh, along that strip and uh, a healthy once it evolves retail commercial presence on the first floor would uh, begin to vitalize the street and I was thinking that we might want to close that up as tight as we could so that there weren't gaps between it and uh, and I I was thinking that it was 25 feet but I was getting the front and the side mixed up and I know we'd probably need to have cars coming through so you could probably eliminate the uh, side yard setback to zero but you would still effectively um, have penetrations that would be uh, gaps in the frontage so I think my uh, my aspiration wouldn't be achieved by eliminating the eliminating the, the, the side yard setback well Nate I thought you had somewhere in there about consolidation of Sort of of parking between uh, adjacent properties. What about allowing zero setback on one side or the other? 
in which case you could have a pair of buildings by two different owners that could be abutting. Um, you know, they'd have to give up the air, the, the windows on those sides. Um, but, uh, you know, that might be a way to reduce the number of vehicular access breaks along the street. Uh, Janet, go ahead. You are muted. Um, so you're saying there's three apartment buildings that could be built on the west side. How many could be built on the east side? Because, you know, and also considering like redevelopment, because I, I kind of worrying about the nursing home. I know it's not exactly an industry that people make a lot of money at. And so if you did the same analysis on the east side of the street, how many apartment buildings could go in there? Yeah, I mean, I haven't. You know, I can't say three is the definitive number. I was just saying, if you look quickly, it seems like with, you know, say 500 feet from the intersection and 300 feet from apartment buildings, you know, that it limits that number. Um, you know, potentially if it's the same length of street, then it's kind of the same, kind of the same metric, right? Um, it really depends on, like I said, where that kind of first unit goes in and then what are the land use constraints? And so- Well, but Nate, that, that, that buffer goes in all directions, right? Right. So if there's a, a building on one side of the street, we'll force the same spacing on the other side of the street. Right. What, why wouldn't you want apartment buildings on corners or close to the, the corners? Well, I think typically that's where you'd want to have, you know, stores or vibrancy on the first floor. And so, you know, if you want to get people in and, you know, have have activity on the streets, it would be at the intersections. And, you know, maybe mid block is where you could have an apartment building. All right, uh, Janet, is that it? I think, you know, I, actually my only question is like, what, you know, I think we're, these are good discussions, but I think um, my question is like, what are the next steps? Cause we haven't talked to any property owners or businesses in that area or the many residents around there, including the residents of places like the Arbors. And so I I wonder, you know, it's not maybe next time, but, you know, we get, we're we coming to a thing that we think we can support. And I, I'd like to know, think about next steps to bring it to the larger immediate community to get their feedback and ideas too, before we, you know, go any further. I also, you know, I, I, you know, I know we're doing this downtown design standards thing with Dodson Flinker, and I've seen a bunch of their work. And, you know, it's very specific. And it's very specific, like saying, like, this kind of door works, this kind of door doesn't work. And I'm wondering about the timing of, you know, these design standards or guidelines are very general. And I'm just wondering, you know, we, I think the key thing is, and I've said this since I moved in Amherst, I don't think people care that much about a building is it, if it looks good. You know, I, I said this when I lived in Porter Square, it's like you could build a monstrosity and everybody hates and you could build a slaughterhouse that looks beautiful and people aren't going to care what's going on inside so much, or maybe not anymore. But I just think that um, increased density, increased heights, um, it's got to look good. And these design standards aren't super specific. Like if Valley CDC could design every building, I'd be fine because they understand that what makes their buildings acceptable you know, in neighborhoods is that they look really good and they fit in. And so I'm wondering, like, we're going to have this very long, lovely process for design guidelines for Amherst Center. And then are we just going to patch something together for University Drive or we can we benefit from that? But my real question is like, so what are the next steps? And I really do want to, as the board or the planning department to reach out to the, the stakeholders, um, the people who live there, work there, or own business, own buildings there. All right. Nate, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think next steps can be, you know, send comments and, you know, in addition to what we've discussed tonight, you know, we can have revisions to the bylaw or, you know, uh, have you know, different ideas that could be discussed at the next meeting or meetings. You know, in terms of the design guidelines, I, you know, I don't, <clears throat> you know, downtown I think is different than here. And so, I think, you know, if after that process, we like some of the standards that has been developed for downtown, we could apply them here. But, you know, 
I, I don't want, you know, my thought would be not to have this become overly prescriptive in terms of, uh, you know, window style or door style. This, this isn't a local historic district and it's, you know, and so I'd, I'd want to see what, you know, we do reference the design review standards that are in the bylaw and that talks about window spacing patterns, a number of things I think the board could be empowered to use to say something doesn't meet those, right? And I don't think that's been done, but I think it could be. And so maybe we have some stronger language in the overlay in terms of that, but I don't want to say, well, we have to have cornices in every building and we have to have, you know, symmetric windows or whatever, right? I mean, I think that um, we want to, we could have some design guidelines, but I don't want to say it has to look just like, you know, the Hastings building all down University Drive. That's, you know, it's, that's kind of, that's, that's not what I'm envisioning as, as a possibility there. And so, um, but, you know, if Dawson has some ideas for what, what are good, you know, is it kind of discussions of proportions or things, but like I said, I think the design review principles already have that. And so, you know, just trying to use those. Uh, for a review here would could be important. Um, so, so the only time I've seen the design review standards really used is in the Spring Street building. And, you know, we had the same developer, we have three buildings, four buildings by the same developer. And the only time the design review board stood up and said, you know, like the building that is across from um, the Boltwood Inn, and they really changed it. They changed the roof, they changed the everything about it. And it's really the most attractive building that Archipelago has built that hasn't incited, you know, revolution amongst the, the residents. And so, you know, you know, it's great to say these things, but nobody is pushing back. And we have these buildings downtown that a lot of people don't like. And University Drive can come become a whole series of boxes, and we can just sort of say, "Hey, we, we built apartments, bulky apartments, we're housing, you know, we did our work." But I think we can do better because we're offering developers and property owners a huge economic gift, and we can ask for something in return. And loose standards means no standards, and if we don't apply the design standards, they don't they don't get done. And that was a kind of a rogue board, I think from you know, my 20 years in Amherst and they got a great building out of it. Okay. Um, Karen. I agree. I think we have to make certain that this is attractive and not uh, just a bunch of uh, blocks that house a lot of people. It's, it's important for the whole town, regardless of, of where it is. Okay. All right, I don't see any more hands at this point. Uh, I guess so I, at this point, I will ask the, the members of the public who've been patiently listening. There are still eight members of the public that are at least showing up on my screen. Do any of you want to make a public comment at this time? You can have up to three minutes. I see one hand. Pam, you want to bring Claire Bertrand over? Uh, and then I now see a second one. Hello, Claire. Hello, thank you for having this conversation and for considering um, housing density. Uh, um, give us your street address. Okay, you... sorry, Claire Bertrand. I'm at 610 Bay Road. Thank you. Uh, and, right. and Pam, could you restart the timer? There we go. I, um, I visit University Drive regularly, as I'm sure we all do. Um, and, uh, I feel like it's a really ideal location in town to see housing density, um, proximity to the university, both for students, um, and, and grad students, families, and staff, um, workforce housing is needed as well. Um, and there's easy access between, um, the distance is, is reasonable. The bike path makes it. Uh, alternate to the car is so good. Um, and I think it's it's a space where uh, height uh, height of buildings will uh, it is welcome. Um, you've got both the um, sense of space that comes from a very long straight street. Um, and you've got you're kind of lower down from the climb that goes up into town or, the stretch out to Route 9. I feel like uh, height would work well there. And um, 
Just one other suggestion I have besides generally encouraging this, and I really value hearing all of you chew on um, a lot of this that, that Nate and, and staff have put together um, to make it better. Um, thank you because you're working hard at this and, and it's needed. Um, I would just encourage you to consider other possible zones um, that like this street our, our road are perhaps underutilized of other our office park or PRP zones um, that perhaps could uh, use the same kind of um, intensity zoning uh, so that we could see uh, housing built in other areas. So thank you again. All right, thank you, Claire. All right, Pam, let's bring mm -hmm. over Elizabeth Vierling next. Elizabeth, please mm -hmm. remind us of the of your address. Elizabeth, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah. Sorry for that delay. We can hear you. All right, great. Um, yes, Elizabeth Vierling, 36 Cottage Street. And um, I want to thank you for having this discussion. I think it's really important that it continue. And I really appreciate listening to it. Um, and I just wanted to support the idea that all buildings in this overlay be mixed use buildings um, in agreement with Bruce. Um, this seems totally logical. If we want to build community and limit car use, we want to have as many services available within walking distance as possible. Um, if we build mostly apartments, I think we're essentially creating a different type of sprawl that still re requires everyone to get in their car to fill all of their needs. Um, I also do not understand the concept that all commercial needs to be on the street. Um, uh, for example, right now, my tax attorney is on the corner of Amity and University, but back behind the street. You know, daycare, doctors, business offices, et cetera, don't need to be on the street. Uh, good services will be used even if they aren't seen from the street. Um, finally, I'm concerned about the concept of not specifying some type of parking requirement. I agree with what was said about families. Families with children, aging parents are hard pressed to run their lives without cars. And as much as I would like to see car use limited, there would have to be a major change to public transportation for this to be realistic, which does not seem to be within the time frame we were dealing with here. Um, for parking, I'm also concerned about the goal to transition to more electronic vehicles, which is not compatible right now with on-street parking. So I just think these are things I would ask you to also consider as the discussion continues. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna move on to Janet Keller. Uh, Claire, I see your hand raised and you've already spoken. So I'm gonna hold, okay, the hand went down. So let's bring over Janet. Hi, Janet, if you would uh, remind us of your street address, you have three minutes. Sure, 120 Pulpit Hill Road. Um, I also uh, greatly appreciate um, the board's discussion of key issues here. I'm glad um, Nate um, met the wetland. Um, uh, I photographed some of those wetlands um, and tried to put together a slideshow for you know you today, um, but I I had trouble with the computer and and a new phone from which I was switching the the photographs, so um, I'll send those as soon as I get them in, in order. But um, I think in addition to um, many of the other items that folks have discussed, um, I'm, I'm with um, the uh, those who have said uh, commercial on the fl first floor um, would be livelier. I, would really like to uh, not have blocks of apartment uh, buildings. 
Um, and um, the main thing I wanted to say is that um, I hope that, um, and I didn't hear your earlier discussion. I came, came in late um, tonight. So I um, hope you are in deep discussions with the wetlands administrator and the conservation commission, because as we all know, this is the, the uh, wetlands are uh, extensive as uh, Nate's map shows and um, the uh, warmer, wetter, wet, wetter weather we're having due to climate change um, will make that critical. So um, appreciate your work and um, looking forward. Oh, uh, the final thing is the design is critical. Um, it, it makes it makes uh, living uh, in a place um, much uh, much better and makes attracts people and um, I hope uh, we um, ensure that the designs are top notch. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Next up is Tom Reedy. Hello, Tom. Hello, Mr. Chair. I, I, I think you're an Amherst resident. You'll have to give us your street address if you I'm are. I'm not an Amherst resident, but we, we do maintain an office at 6 Southeast Street in okay. Amherst. Thank you. Um, so two, two quick points, uh, ultimately in support. You know, I really appreciate the conversation that the board's having and all the work that staff has put into it. Um, I'm very pleased to hear that they're going to be working with uh, local design professionals to take a look at what actually could be built, you know, because I think in a lot of the um, pieces of the overlay district are are very smart. It's just how they apply to the actual land that you're looking to apply them to. Westerly side of University Drive, as Nate had pointed out, has some small postage size stamp lots what could actually be done there. So I think once you start to look at what could actually be done, and you know, I, I work with plenty of developers, Barry included, we're always happy to have a conversation with staff or the board to talk about the way that developers are looking at this. So um, I know there'll be more conversations, but, but we're more than happy to have those as well. And then second is just really from my practice, permitting across the state, most of the time I found uh, well-written and successful zoning bylaws where the board here, the planning board would give itself discretion uh, in the future. And so instead of having some compulsion where there's no wiggle room and somebody's coming in for a, a variance or trying to get a zoning amendment, allowing discretion for either this planning board or a future planning board based upon the circumstances of the site or the project or society at that time uh, is just really good planning. So just to keep that in the back of your head. And that's it for me. Thanks for the work. Okay, thank you, Tom. And Pam, looks like we have one more, George Ryan. Mm -hmm. Should be all set, George. I just unmuted myself, I hope. Yes, um, I can hear you. Thank you, thank you for letting me speak. And, and tonight I speak as not as a member of town council, but as a 36 year resident of the town of Amherst and someone who actually lives just two blocks from University Drive. And I salute the planning board for taking the time and taking on this issue. I think it's important. And I think University Drive is the perfect place to begin to look at encouraging development, development which can both meet our critical need for housing and also help us expand our tax base, which is also critical. And I, I really hope that you will keep those two very much in mind. I appreciate the comments about aesthetics. Um, I appreciate the comments about look, and they're not immaterial. But I think for many people in this town, it's the need for a place to live. And for many taxpayers, it's uh, some relief uh, in the tax area and in expanding our tax base. I also think it's, it's proximity to UMass makes this an attractive place to start. So I hope, as they say, that you will move with all deliberate speed. 
And I also hope this will not be your last uh, exploration. I want to echo something that uh, was said earlier. I think there are other areas in town that uh, could, could be looked at that might provide appropriate places for this sort of dense uh, development, particularly mixed use development. So I appreciate very much the work you're doing. Um, I hope you'll keep in mind the, the, the very critical need for housing and, and the importance that that plays in helping us expand our tax base, especially through mixed use development. And uh, please keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Thank you, George. All right. Uh, time is 8.57. We've been at this for, what, two and a half hours? Um, I'm sure there'll be more to come. And uh, I don't see any other hands. So I'm wondering whether we're kind of uh, spent for this evening uh, and whether we should just leave it at that. And uh, please, please send your uh, further comments to Nate uh, and, and Chris so that they can consider them when they come back with another round of, of drafts for this. Um, any objections to moving on? I know, Janet, you're uh, probably headed out. All right, thank you for joining us. All right, so time is 8.58. Janet has left our meeting and we'll move on to the next items on the agenda. And thank you, Nate, for your work. It's great to see stuff on paper and, uh, you know, give us something to react to, even if it's not all exactly what we would have written. <laughs> all right, and, uh, and I'll send my comments along in a, probably over the weekend. Okay, um, next item on the agenda is old business, not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Anything to report, Chris? Sorry, I think the next item on the agenda was downtown oh, design oh, guidelines. You're right. That's yeah. What I, I thought uh, too. Yes. I okay. misread. I, I I made a mistake. Jump. You jumped. Okay. Item five: just downtown design mm -hmm. guidelines. Chris, go ahead and tell us where we're at, and or Nate. I don't know. Who's Nate. Taking Nate the lead is on the man on on this project All right. here. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. I think the. Um, yeah, we, Dodson would like to get moving. It's already, you know, um, third week in February, but they're hoping to start this month with stakeholder groups and a working group. And so, you know, in the packet, there was a timeline and it, you know, shows like an 18 month um, calendar and it really does build on itself. So they're, you know, they're hoping to, uh, you know, have a pretty intense public outreach a kind of visioning phase and then work on these iterative um, standards and, and involve the public at you know a number of of points whether it's through um, you know the working group or through public events and meetings they'd be coming back formally to the planning board and others and so you know <clears throat> I think what the kind of the big piece is um, you know they like to have a working group of 25 to 30 people that could they meet with five to six times throughout the um, the process at key points to uh, to you know get feedback, and so this working group would be, you know, work you know reviewing uh, products by Dodson and then providing feedback in the meeting. Um, you know, they they'd be open to the public. They it wouldn't necessarily be um, you know a public meeting per se, but there'd be you know be open to the public. So I think would this, the state would this be like the solar bylaw working group. No, so that was. I think it's a little different uh, in that it was appointed to the town manager and the, the working group there was then making a re recommendation to the town. This working group is really just working with Dodson. And so, okay. um, you know, and then there's stakeholder groups and we're looking at, you know, a number of stakeholder groups with, I don't, I don't know, five to eight to 10, 12 people in a group. So one might be, you know, uh, we're looking at having uh, downtown property owners and business owners board representatives as a stakeholder group, residents as a group. And we'd like to get those meetings going in the next few weeks to have Dodson meet with uh, those individuals. Uh, we're trying to put names in, down on paper and come up with uh, uh, this, this stakeholder group 
And that would just be an initial meeting where they would ask questions. Uh, the idea would be, would be in person, probably at town hall. Staff wouldn't be in attendance. It would be really just the groups in Dodson. And so, you know, we're hoping that it would be, it would allow for kind of open communication. And so, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have comments attributed to this, the specific individual, but really just generally from the working group so that if, you know, say developers are there, they're willing to share thoughts in terms of what they think works or doesn't or what they see downtown, you know, what do residents think or feel. So, you know, that's kind of the first step. And then we can kind of keep it going. Um, and so, you know, like I said, I think the planning board will be involved in a few different ways. Members can be uh, part of the stakeholder groups and the working group. And then you're, you know, you're formally a part of the process uh, at key intervals to re to review the products. So. All right. So you will be reaching out to us about uh, people who are interested in being part of that? Right. OK. Chris? I think Karin and Janet have already indicated that they're interested in being part of this. So others are interested, too. They should speak up. Well, I'm, I'm certainly interested. Um, you can put me on that list. And I'll say that, well, I, I forget now how we are, what we decided if it was Dodson or the town would host a web, you know, a web page with the information. And, you know, there'll definitely be ways for the public and, you know, board members to provide feedback, whether it's, you know, in a formal group or not. So the idea is that everything would become available online and, you know, can be, comments can be submitted any, any time. Okay. All right. Do you need anything else from us this evening? No. All right. So it's just an update. All right. I think it's now safe for me to move to the next item, which is the old business. Uh, time is 9.03. Chris, any old business? Pam? I could just report that the, um, the Meadows subdivision um, went to town council the same night that the Amherst Hills subdivision did. But there were difficulties because the planning board had um, recommended to town council that there be a three-party agreement with the town, the developer, and the residents, each paying for part of getting the road up to um, you know proper status. Um, but it appears that there was some information that was missing during that conversation. And that information is kind of being circulated now. So I'm expecting that the Meadows will be reconsidered by town council before too long. And that you um, you probably won't be getting a referral because you it was already referred to you a number of years ago and you made this recommendation for the three-party agreement. I'm just sort of... Um, bringing you up to speed on what's going on. And we're hoping to get some sort of resolution soon, I hope. So okay. just wanted to let you know about that. All right. All right, moving on to new business, not anticipated. Anything? OK. Uh, Form A, A and R subdivision? No. no. I could report that there is an A and R that's part of the Ball Lane Valley CDC um, comprehensive permit, and because of the way a comprehensive permit is processed, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals is going to step in and act in the shoes of the Planning Board um, to sign that A and R plan. And the A and R takes advantage of being part of the comprehensive permit because it won't need to comply with the building circle requirement or the lot area requirement. It will be a flag lot that has appropriate frontage, but the other two requirements will be waived by the comprehensive permit, I believe, if, mm. if the zoning board actually you know, agrees to this plan. Um, so I just wanted to let you know about that because people may ask, well, why did the, why was the zoning board signing that plan and not the planning board? And it's because it's part of a comprehensive permit. Okay. okay. 
so they can all meet you behind town hall to sign the A and R instead of instead of us. That's right. <laughs> well, I hope they enjoy it. Okay, um, upcoming ZBA applications. I don't have any new ones to report on. I'm not sure if my colleagues are aware of something that I am not. I think we may be able to report on them next time because several have come in and I'm not aware of what they all are. But tomorrow night, the zoning board will be considering a variance on the property at the corner of University Drive and Amity Street. And that relates to some degree with what we're talking about doing on University Drive. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals meetings are not on television. If you wanted to attend it, you'd have to go on the website and find the link to the meeting, just like you would for any other meeting, but then you could attend it and listen to their conversation. So. Okay. Uh, okay, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. We have the application for the property um, that includes Hastings. I may have told you about this last time. Yep. And so it's a mixed use building and it will be coming to you on March 6th. Okay. All right. Time is 9.08. We'll go on to planning board committee and liaison reports. Bruce, anything on PVPC? Well, yes, there was a quarterly meeting uh the there was some not regular kind of business done and they uh, voted the allocations and uh just so we know amist uh, contributes seventy three hundred and forty seven dollars um some of the town allocations are really small because they're small towns it's quite interesting to see how um <laughs> how how um, how small all this stuff is in some respects. Uh, the, 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 the organization, though, gets funds from all sorts of places, and the annual budget of uh, the corp of, of PVPC is about $7.5 million, so it all adds up. But most of the time was spent uh, on a presentation uh, related to the proposed Affordable Homes Act. That's something that's uh, moving through uh, the legislature for the deadline vote, well, uh, in late July, which if it's not taken, I guess they have to start all over again. But uh, there was a fairly thorough presentation given about what the bill proposed as, uh, uh, and and uh, its coverage and so forth. I won't go into it in any particular detail, except to say that I do have the presentation. It's a, uh, and I could, um, I could, uh, I could send it to Chris. I could make it available if uh, folks are interested in the uh, in what is what is to be uh, provided or what is proposed to be provided in this uh, proposed new legislation. I think that would be great. Okay, I will. Uh, I will send that. Um, I mean, it's a huge thing—a housing bond bill of about four over four billion dollars. So, I mean, this is a lot of a lot of money and. A great number of uh, what are they thinking of about um, 160,000 housing units in various ways? So it's uh, it, it, it could, could have some impact, I think. Okay, I will do that. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. I have nothing to report for CPAC tonight. Um, Karen, anything for DRB? No, we're going to meet again on Monday. Okay. And Chris for CRC? I have no reports. All right. I have uh, no report as chair. Chris, any report as staff? I have no further report as staff, no. All right. Can I just jump in quickly? Yeah, sure, Nate. <clears throat> um, uh, the staff is updating the open space and recreation plan, and the planning board is required to review and, you know, I'll say approve it or um, recommend it to the state. And so the hope would be to have a draft in the spring, April, May, and it'll come to the board. We can, you know, have it earlier, but we have a, we have a survey online right now uh, for residents to complete. And then that'll help inform kind of the goals and vision and action steps that, that are uh, incorporated into the plan. So that's something that'll be coming before the board 
Uh, the other thing is there's a property owner in town who has reached out uh, to staff saying that they might want to remove their um, land from chapter, from chapter 61. And so there's a right of first refusal and that would come to the planning board. Uh, and that may, you know, it may, it may come and, you know, it, it seems like, it seems likely. And then the planning board has, you know, so many days to act. And so that could be, uh, you know, March or April that the planning board would have to, you know, would, could, uh, would review this right of first refusal. And this would be where we recommend to town council to exercise the right or not? Right. Yeah. So similar to say like the road acceptance would be a recommendation to town council to either, you know, purchase the property or do something, you know, what kind of actions to take. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, anything else from anyone? All right. Thank you all. I guess our next meeting is in early March, correct? Hmm. Seems March like six. What a surprise that we're already into March. <laughs> all right. Good night, everyone. Time is 9 12. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Uh, stop recording.